May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be aligned with your love, O oh God, our strength, our courage, our freedom, and our new song. Amen. Amen. Happy homecoming, everyone. Happy homecoming. It sure is great to see you. You all are so beautiful. It's wonderful to be in the midst of all this wonderful, sacred vibration at All Saints Church on Homecoming Sunday, our annual festival of declaring that summertime is over, even though it's pretty hot outside. <laughs> and as a result, most of us are back from the diaspora of summer vacations, etc. We are thrilled that the uh, 1 p.m. band, the instrumentalists, have joined us today for this wonderful music. And the Trouvères who sang at 9 and 11, 15, thank you, Trouvères, are at their full, full speed. And the parish council now called Parish Celebrations have done such a great job of organizing us. And then Gary Leonard and the altar of the Flower Guild with all this beautiful, these beautiful flowers. Just absolutely <laughs> stunning and moving. Oh. True beauty moves you. I'm, I've been so grateful that uh, the parish celebrations or parish council chose as our theme today, peace. God knows we need it in the world today. And uh, chose to lift up the refrain of one of our favorite peace songs around here, Shanti Salam Shalom. I want to tell you a little story about that song or that hymn because I think it suggests a way for us to be thinking about one another and what we do together this year, this program year which we begin today. Um, when that song was written by uh, the children of two parishioners at All Saints, um, it was originally the, the refrain said, shalom, 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 that wonderful Jewish concept of peace that includes justice and mysticism. And uh, during the first Gulf War, back in the last century, when we had an interfaith peace service here with so many of our Jewish and Muslim friends present, we thought it was unseemly just to have the Jewish word for peace, and uh, we got permission from the composers to put in salam. Then, after 9-11, which we just celebrated or observed the 13th anniversary of last week, um, some of us uh, were at the mosque at USC and heard an imam say the following words. To be religious in the 21st century is to be interreligious. Now that just seared itself into my soul and mind and ministry and it's become a mantra for me and I think for many of us here ever since 9-11. If we're really serious, about being 21st century religious people, we have to be interreligious. And so we had another interfaith worship service, and we decided that it would be good to add the Hindu word for peace in the refrain, Shanti, Salam, Shalom, and ever since it has been that way. And we got permission from the composers to do it. Now, one of the reasons I'm grateful that this song is our theme for today is that it illustrates the reality that sometimes you and I are living by songs that are too small for our lives. And those songs need to be updated. We haven't changed the songs we sing to be big enough and coherent enough for the complexity of our lives 
and for 21st century life in this universe and all that we are learning about the universe. Living by a song that's too small for your life can be the case literally, as in this particular hymn and other hymns that we've changed the lyrics of when we worship here at All Saints. But having an insufficiently expansive song to sing can be psychologically and spiritually and relationally true in our daily lives or in our national lives or in our international affairs as well. In fact, I would argue that where there is violence to self or to others, where there is bigotry, exclusion, injustice, where there is violence anywhere, it is because our songs are too small for us. We human beings have not changed the song we are singing to be compassionate enough, hopeful enough, inclusive enough for the occasion and the times in which we live, and the God who created us. For instance, this summer, the police killing of an unarmed black teenager in Ferguson, Missouri. That took place because the community, that community in Ferguson and all of America still is not singing a song that's large enough for our lives together. Our song is too small about race, about police training, about civilian oversight of police, and the militarization of community policing. This summer, the killing of so many innocent non-combatants in Gaza and Israel during the war between Hamas and the Israeli Defense Forces. That is because the song in Israel-Palestine is too small for the complexities there. The song sung there reveals narratives of bigotry and fear and revenge and blame that do not incorporate the basic human rights of Palestinians and Israelis to coexist in mutual respect, peace, and security. And as a way to get rid of the evil of occupation and illegal settlement, settlements. This summer and this fall, the growth of the so-called Islamic State, ISIS or ISIL, and its heinous barbarity of beheading human beings. I don't know if you've heard, but a third person was beheaded this morning, this time a British citizen. The misguided reactive thinking also that perpetual war can somehow bring peace and stability both exist because we have not found an expansive and inclusive enough song. Show me a problem in the world. Show me a dysfunction in a life or a set of relationships or in a family or a business or a faith community, whatever. Show me a dysfunction in any of those places and I think I can show you a prevailing song that is too small for the grandeur of those persons, of those relationships who are perpetuating it and singing that song. They need to change their song to be more expansive and to make more sense in the 21st century. The world of psychology and neuroscience has discovered that this business of having too restrictive a song impacts our own emotional well-being. My neuroscience teacher, Dr. Dan Siegel, continues to talk about having a narrative that is too small, a narrative that is dysfunctional and restrictive. And so it can't help a person have a secure base in love and go through life with security and able then to pass on to others the inspiration for them to have a life that's based securely in love. Now, all of us inherit to some degree dysfunction in our childhoods. And that dysfunction is rooted in some songs that we inherited that we should sing or we were told we should sing about relationships or money or work or religion. 
But just because you were given a song too small for you and for your life doesn't mean that you can't pass on to your children or those you mentor or care for or work with. You don't have to pass on the same dysfunctionally small song. Dr. Siegel says, if, for example, your parent had a rough childhood and your, ch- your parent, because of his or her rough childhood, was unable to make sense of what happened in their life, he or she would be likely to pass on that harshness to you. And you, in turn, would be at risk for passing it along to your children or the people you mentor or work with. Yet, parents who had a tough time in childhood but did find a way to make sense of those experiences have been found in research to have children who were securely attached to them and having a secure base of love. They had somehow stopped handing down the family legacy of a dysfunctional, toxic narrative or song. So how do you do that? The key to rewriting your story or narrative or song that is noble enough for you and the way God made you and for your life is whether somewhere along the journey there was a relationship or a community of relationships with other people who were genuinely attuned to you. And you in turn then could integrate all of the things that happened to you in your inner experience and find some wholeness, some space to reflect on your life in ways that help you make sense of your journey. It's what they call having an earned secure life narrative. And the key to all of this, of having that attunement, attunement go on, the key to rewriting your song so it's big enough and noble enough for you, is whether somewhere along the journey you were seen You were safe, you were soothed, and then you became secure. This summer, um, one of my journeys was to Albuquerque, New Mexico with Zelda Kennedy and my wife and John Depphouse to learn from three very smart people, Richard Rohr, Rob Bell, and a new person in my own life, Sister Elia DeLeo. And these people were articulating a new song for religion and life, a new narrative for religion and for life. And one of the things that struck me was Richard Rohr saying that most people are kinder and more forgiving than the God they grew up with. Now, I'm, I don't have all my bigotedness healed, but I am not as racist as the racist God I grew up with. I'm not as condemning of gay and lesbian bisexual, transgender brothers and sisters as the God I grew up with was. I am not as militaristic and violent as the God I grew up with. And Richard Rohr went on to say one of the reasons so many people leave religion is that they themselves are more nonviolent and they are more just and they are less bigoted than the God that is preached and sung about in a lot of religious communities. 
And then there's the issue of singing a song about God and religion that's big enough to harmonize with the findings of science and interfaith religion relations. I mean, just take the example of evolution that comes from the notion of the Big Bang, that 13.8 billion years ago, all of us came into being through this Big Bang explosion, but it was an explosion from just a small piece of matter that's the size of a seed, and everybody in this room and everybody on the planet and everything that exists and all matter all came from that one little speck of matter. And then you're going to tell me that we're not all one? That's a song too small for us. <laughs> Our religions are too small for us. When it tells us that we have to be tribalistic in our religion, within our religion, and against other religions. How could Israeli or a Gazan say to one another, you're not a part of me? How can a white cop and a black teenager somehow get the notion that you're not a part of me? And then that business about quantum physics about which I know nothing and so I'm going to tell you what somebody else has told me. <laughs> and those of you who are quantum physicists can, can correct me afterwards, but apparently they've gotten down to subatomic part particles, down to the sub, 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 atomic particles and found out that the smallest building block of everything that is that's in you and me and these pews and these flowers and these lights that those little tiny examples of the universe, when you find them, they never occur by themselves. They're always in community with one or two others. And they're spinning together. And apparently if you can separate them and hypothetically, they're here both in Los Angeles and you take one and put it in New York City and for some reason it starts spinning in the opposite direction that it was spinning in Los Angeles. This partner of it will stop spinning in its direction and start spinning in the same direction that this one in New York City is. That the smallest building blocks of subatomic particles are related and their energy impacts the other. And you tell me that you want me to have a religion that pits me against another human being or against the planet or against something in the universe? That song's too small for us. So, in the words of Thomas Berry, we are living in between stories, in between songs. And there are smart, prayerful, thoughtful people working together, conspiring together to write some songs and change some traditional songs so that our songs are not too small and are large enough for the nobility and the grandeur for which each of us was made. These songs, if my neuroscience teacher is right, will be songs of healing us again, of making us whole, of holing us. Songs of healing. And our home is where the healing is. That's why this home coming is so important. We are all called to come home, not necessarily to these pews, but to oneness, to the interconnectivity of us all, to our compassion. And that is why it is so very important for us to forgive. Jesus is saying over and over again, you have heard it said, that old song about how I suppose to love your friends and hate your enemies, 
No, I've got a new song for you. I'm not trying to create a new religion, Christianity. I'm not even trying to reform Judaism. I'm trying to tell you the way the world works is by this song and the way God and the universe work, Jesus says, is to love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. Forgive an infinite number. And if you're counting how many times you've forgiven somebody, you hadn't forgiven them the first time because you're about counting instead of forgiving. <laughs> Jesus was reworking his story constantly. And you and I are here on Homecoming Sunday to rework our stories to have a new song, to become whole makers, healers of one another, so that you and I can heal the world. Everybody we've engaged to come and be a guest at All Saints Church this coming year as a teacher or a preacher, and two people are wanting to come here to launch their books from All Saints Church. I think to a person, they're all about finding a new song that's worthy of our grandeur, our nobility, our beauty. And to the degree we all work together on this new song, we'll be used by God to turn the human race into the human family, to make the planet a paradise and to celebrate the diversity and unity of the entire universe.